Hello and welcome to this digital lesson on intertextual interpretation. But the purpose of this lesson specifically is to get students ready to take on a very particular task in response to Of Mice and Men. I'm going to be talking through a couple of elements in actually designing the task and what we're looking to achieve. And then I'm going to go back and look at some of the background skills and some of the critical thinking that you're going to have to practice in order to really excel in this task. So to start off, I want to talk really briefly about this term intertextuality. It's something that we hear a lot, particularly in the English subject, and it's becoming an even bigger part in stage one and stage two. What we're really talking about here is the relationship between texts. And you can see that highlighted here in this definition. But what does this mean? Well, the thing to think about is that texts often draw information from other texts. And this is becoming increasingly common. You know, when you think about modern texts, modern music, modern movies, they often rely on the assumption that you've previously seen something or read something or heard something that gives it a different sense of meaning. OK, so when a text expects you to have read or to have seen another text, you know, that's intertextuality. And when it uses the ideas of one text to fuel another, again, that's a really important part. If someone were to read your most recent essay on Of Mice and Men, it would be a great example of intertextuality because your essay requires an, a prior understanding from another text in order to give it purpose and meaning. And that's really what intertextuality is all about. You know, a great example of intertextuality, I think, is The Simpsons. And if you're a huge Simpsons fan like I am, you know, you'd be surprised at just how much of that humour comes from understanding the texts where it's from. You know, some of the great things here, we've got references to famous paintings and art, uh, references to you know, superheroes and, and different franchises. Um, I really like this one. This is quite a, a recent uh, reference about a selfie that was taken with Ellen DeGeneres. You know, you can see that this was used in a Simpsons episode. So this isn't even another text. This is a social event, but it's a great example of intertextuality. Uh, we've got films, music. Um, we've got you know, uh, cartoons making reference to other cartoons, making reference to classic movies. This one's The Godfather, in case you didn't follow that one. Um, you know, here we've got, a, again, a sitcom making fun of another sitcom, The Simpsons taking off the Brady Bunch. We've got a classic remake here of Nirvana's Nevermind. We've got James Bond over here, um, and we've got Modern Family. Um, so what you'll find is that, you know, if you really look back through The Simpsons, they have consistently made reference to other texts and other elements of culture that's current at the time. And that's a really vital example of intertextuality in the sense that you don't get the humour of these images unless you understand what text they're referring to. So I want to just go back and talk a little bit about what we really want to get out of you in this assignment. You know, what are we actually looking for? Um, you're going to be reading a text about another text. And what I mean by that is that you're going to be reading an interpretation of, of Mice and Men, okay, written by someone else. And it's a pretty crazy interpretation. You know, I deliberately picked it to potentially ruffle some feathers and get you really thinking. You, know, you can see here the text assumes that you've read of Mice and Men. So in that case, it's already got a sense of intertextuality, but it also holds other assumptions that you will need to identify and discuss. All right, so we're really looking at your ability to identify intertextuality and to discuss your interpretation of that. You know, that's a tricky thing. Your success in this task depends on your ability to share reflections on the use of intertextuality, showing an understanding of how multiple factors create content. All right, we're going to break that down. That sounds pretty heavy and I don't blame you for being confused. OK, so just pay attention and you should be feeling all right by the end of this lesson. Now, to give a bit of a sense of purpose, look, originally the task that you're currently doing was set up differently in the curriculum. So I've had a bit of a, a, a play with it and I've changed it around. But just to get you a sense of what you were supposed to originally do, you were originally supposed to find you know, two uh, reviews or two um, different things about your novel. So you would have been trawling the internet looking for you know, who knows what. Um, 
and you'll be looking for things that, that show a different perspective on that novel. It says here you develop a response to the novel based on your own interpretations and the interpretations that you've read. And, uh, and there were some key questions that you had to look at here, which in this case were about a discussion of what you agree with, what you don't agree with, and what you think might be missing. Now, look, my issue with this original task was the fact that it didn't put enough emphasis on you creating your own interpretation. And as you know, that's what the essay that we've recently done is all about. You know, I really wanted you um, to communicate to me what you thought this book was all about. Okay, that was what it was what was really important. It was about developing ideas, it was about making connections between the content of this text and what you saw um, its effect on the world was. Okay, so you've now done that. What I want you to do now is look at another interpretation and tell me if you agree or do not agree with that in light of the work that you've just done on your own essay. Now, the assessment strategy, therefore, has slightly changed because this original task that other Year 11 classes did had four assessable outcomes, but I've changed it. Our strategy means that I'm assessing you for three things in your essay, okay? And you can see those on the assignment sheet. This section covers one, one assessment outcome. So I'm really looking for one very specific thing from you in this, which means that this is a much more targeted and specific task. The big thing that you're being assessed on is your analysis of complex intertextual connections between different texts. Now that's a real mouthful of a thing. I'm going to break that down over this lesson, um, but it's really worth understanding what it is that I'm actually marking you on. Okay, very significant. Um, this is the standards that I'm using to assess you. So it's worth familiarizing yourself with this. These are on the task sheet for uh, what you need to do. You can find that on the SharePoint. But in this case, it really breaks down exactly what determines an A in comparison to an E. And you can see the keyword that associates with the A, you know, you always have to look for those defining adjectives, is complex, complex intertextual connections. Okay, as opposed to just you know, analysis of connections okay, um, or description. So look at that kind of language. How do you show complex intertextual connections? Well, I hope that that's going to be an outcome of this video. So what does this actually mean? What are you going to have to do uh, to get a good grade on this? You know, what's the point, you might even think? Um, your task is to look at a text I provided. I've gone out and I have found an analysis of, of mice and men. It is different to yours. I can guarantee that. You're going to compare this with your own essay and you're going to write a discussion of what you agree and disagree with and how this has influenced your perspective on the novel as a whole. Okay, this is going to be an informal reflection about 500 words. I don't care about... Uh, you know, I care about content here. I don't care about your writing. I'm not going to be marking your, your formal writing and your teal structure and all of that kind of business. Okay, this is purely a thinking exercise. I don't mind if you want to record it orally and give it to me that way. That's fine as well. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So let's do some background work. This is where I'm going to be teaching you the specific skills that I want you to be able to demonstrate back to me. Okay, so there's some thinking models here. Okay, I want you to have this in the back of your head as we're going along um, because you're going to be actively doing exactly what I'm talking about in the next few minutes for this assessment. Okay, so I'm going to start fairly generally, uh, but then I'm going to show you a very specific example of applying an intertextual interpretation on a specific text. Okay, so it's something to look forward to, I guess. I know this is all very exciting to you. All right. So let's think about this image. A really interesting. It's an image of a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And I always like to start with images, as you know, because it gets you thinking about your impression of this image. Now, if I showed this to most people in modern society, you would say, yuck. You would say that is a disgraceful figure. It's a negative representation of racism. I don't want anything to do with it. And that's fine, you know, that, you know I'm certainly not uh, here to contrast that. But what I will say is that if you were at a different point in history, in a different point of society, 
you may very well have a very different representation of this text. The way you interpret it might not be quite as negative as you think. And as you know, there are still people out there. You know, if I, for example, was looking at this from the perspective of the person in this picture, um, then I definitely have a different perspective. You know, so it, it's about recognising that people's interpretations are going to be very different depending on where they come from. Here's something you might identify with a little bit more. Um, it's an advertisement for American apparel. And again, depending on perhaps who you are or what your background is, you may very well be appalled by this, um, or it's possible that you might find it very appealing. I deliberately chose this image because it's quite provocative in the sense that you, know, you, you could say that it's incredibly sexist, you could say it's overly sexualized, you could say it's inappropriate, you could say that it reinforces negative stereotypes. All of these things are certainly sound and valid interpretations, but they're all influenced by you as a, as a viewer. And it's about thinking about where does that come from? You know, is it because of your gender? Is it because of your upbringing? Is it because of your orientation? Um, these are all things to take into account. One of the things we're really looking at here is unpacking what justifies different interpretations. You know, really critical thinking. Look at this. Here I've just taken a, a picture of a young Muslim woman. Okay, it looks like a really nice person. But how do you think this image would be interpreted differently by different members of our society. You know, let's just take a couple into account. You know, Pauline Hanson, of course, as we know, um, is a very open um, uh, parliamentary figure in criticism of other cultures. You know, a very blatantly racist individual who we know would take a direct negative connotation to this image. You know, some of the other people, though, like we had a very tolerant democratic president recently in Barack Obama. Or what about like a young Muslim male? You know, how would he react to a young Muslim female? Well, he'd probably just think it's business as usual, just another person. Um, what about, you know, we, we have this kind of uh, inherent kind of media scare of, of threat, which comes with Islam and, and Middle Eastern uh, cultures. So yeah, as a police officer or, uh, you know, somebody worked at an airport terminal, you know, do you think that these different perspectives are influenced by background, by upbringing, by gender, by political beliefs, by society? You know, these are some really interesting and big questions to ask. And again, when we're talking about this type of complex analysis, this is what you need to ask yourself. So interpretation, it takes on more features than we might have initially imagined. In your task for your essay, you had to think about what this text meant to you. And that was a difficult thing to do. But I can guarantee that the interpretation of all of the people in the classroom was ultimately fairly similar because you all come from a similar culture you're all a similar age. Well, we had a bit of a gender difference there. You know, we didn't have anyone vehemently, um, you know, taking it from a, a really different perspective. And that's not a criticism. It's just a recognition that people's perspective is impacted by their personal circumstances. And that determines our sense of value and importance. Okay, and you're going to see some examples of that in just a second. Um, when we talk about this idea of value, it's interesting to think about, you know, like something like this. So I've, I've just taken a, an image here of some rotting food and asked you the question, is this valuable? Now, you might see where I'm going with this, you know, but of course you would say, no, this is rubbish. This is garbage. It belongs in the bin. But depending again on your uh, potential audience, if you're talking about kind of, you know, here I've got a picture of a young uh couple in their kitchen, you know, they look a little bit sickeningly in love. Um, you know, they're eating fresh food, you know, they're enjoying each other's company. For them, it would probably go straight in the bin. In this other image, though, and you've probably seen certain things like this, you know, images of children who grow up in uh, countries of starvation, grow up in uh, places of contamination, grow up in uh, junkyards, anything along that line. The value of this 
image or the value of this food would be significantly different. And I just think that's an interesting example about interpretation in terms of how what we see as important and what we see as valuable can be inherently different depending on who we are and where we come from. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Look, I thought we'd get a bit biblical here, and you're probably thinking, you know, I I'm, I'm, should really be talking to an RE class, but I just thought this was a really interesting example because um, I, I was in this conversation very recently about this text. And I just think that there's some really great opportunities to illustrate some understanding about critical thinking. So Ephesians 5, verse 21 to 24, this is a verse that's used very commonly at weddings. And there's another section to this, verse 25, which maybe adds a little bit more balance to it. And I encourage you to check it out. But I, I just thought we'd look at this first part of it. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit their, to their husbands in everything. Okay, pretty heavy words there. And I can just imagine uh, some students seething, perhaps, at this, you know, just because of its language and you know, some of the things that it's, it's offering there. And again, you know, it's about recognising where this text came from and why. Um, but let, you know, let's unpack this a little bit. I thought we'd have a look at some different interpretations. And I, what I'm really trying to show you here is how we can start to determine interpretations, not only about the text, but also about the person who's sharing their point of view, um, because this is really very much what you're going to have to do for this assignment. So, um, Ask yourself, how do you see these verses? You know, do you support them? Do you think that they're, well, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but you know, are you against them? What might impact your interpretation? Would the interpretation be different at another point in history? And that's just something like I just said. Consider when this was written. You know, do you think that your interpretation of this would be different if you were born a thousand years ago? Now, that's a crazy question to ask, but... It just goes to show that, you know, time is a bit of a factor when we are looking at texts. And even Of Mice and Men um, was written almost 100 years ago. So very interesting. So the short answer, of course, is, well, it depends. You know, how do you interpret the word submit? You know, I think that's one of the key kind of elements in there. Like, you know, a lot of people, as soon as you say the word submit, they think, oh, I'm not submitting to anyone. You know, but it also um, leads into this idea of, how did Christ love the church? It says that wives should submit to their husbands in the same way that, that Christ loved the church or, you know, or that the church submits to Christ. How do you interpret that relationship? You know, your understanding and opinion on these two things is ultimately going to determine what you think. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at three different interpretations of this text, okay? And you might find this a bit amusing. They're all very different. I source these from around the place, different parts of the internet. Um, and I, I think it just does a good job of showing different opinions. The point I'm going to make at the end is the fact that having looked at these different opinions strengthens our overall understanding of the text and society as a whole. And hopefully that'll come clear to you after this. So let's look at interpretation example one, okay? And I'm just looking at that first section. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So this interpretation has said that this verse is completely discriminatory against women. It embodies the idea that women are objects or slaves in a marriage rather than equal partners in the relationship. This is just a typical example of how history has created a chauvinistic impression that men are superior and women are second-class citizens. Okay, this might have been something that came to your mind or something similar when you first read this. So what can we suggest about this interpretation? Okay, well, I've written here the word feminist or the fact that it's been written on behalf of women or on behalf of, of the rights of women. Okay, where did I get that from? You know, where have I determined that this might be an underlying idea behind this? Well, my text examples here is that they've said it's discriminatory against women. Okay, the idea that women are objects or slaves in a marriage. Okay, um, you know they've also perhaps you know I could say that it's implied when they say that um, 
you know, there's a chauvinistic impression that men are superior. Um, it's modern, okay? I can make an interpretation based on this, that it's modern. This text is very modern because it makes reference to history. You know, this is an example of how history has created a chauvinistic impression. It's not suggesting that, um, you know, it's, it's considering it in the time that it was written. Okay, so there's a really interesting interpretation. It's also influenced by society. It, it actually refers to problems that are already existing outside of the text. Okay, so there's ideas talked in here, like this idea that women are objects or women are slaves in a marriage. You know, that's potentially an idea that exists already, and this person is suggesting that this text reinforces that already existing idea. Now that's an example of intertextuality, okay, because we're taking something that already exists, we're assuming people are, are open to it. You know, another example might be women are second class citizens. Now that is not said in this verse at all, but that is very much an established idea that already exists, that this person is suggesting is being supported by this text. Okay, that's intertextuality. If you can identify that kind of thing, then you're on the right track. Let's look at another interpretation. Okay, same thing. Um, but notice here it says, the, the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. So this person said, <clears throat> this, pers this verse couldn't be more true. In most marriages, men are still head of the household. They are still statistically more likely to be the money earner. And research shows that men still make most financial decisions and take responsibility for major family decisions. We live in a world where men are expected to be leaders. We need to be in charge whether we like it or not. If women are going to place these expectations on us, they have to be willing to accept our judgment. Now, you'll probably guess that this is really the opposite of the other interpretation. Um, but let's think about this. Obviously, it speaks more on behalf of males than females. And interestingly enough, the writer is clearly a male themselves because they say uh, whether we like it or not. You know, we need to be in charge whether we like it or not. So he includes himself in with that term. It brings on outside perspectives to support ideas. It talks about statistically more likely to be money earners. It talks about research shows that men still make the most financial decisions. Now, this is, again, this is information that isn't in the original text, but this person is bringing that information from obviously other things that they have read to support the idea and their interpretation of this text. That's intertextuality, okay? So I'm reinforcing this a lot because I really want you um, to develop a strong understanding of this idea, okay? It suggests, and I think this is interesting, it suggests that men are placed under unfair pressure to lead, okay? So we, like we've got this idea that women place these expectations on us, okay? If we, like it's actually, he's suggesting that it's, it's the fault of females that men have to be leaders and men have to take care of everything. Men are still the head of the household in most marriages. So again, that, that hasn't come from this text, okay? That's come from experience. It's come from things that this particular writer has been through, things they've seen, things they've read, and they're bringing it in with them into their interpretation. That's intertextuality, okay? So again, some really good examples of how we can identify intertextuality within these texts. I've got one more interpretation for you, okay? Number three. Again, same verse. This person says, the previous perspective shared are completely missing the point. People are getting too hung up on the word submit and are missing the fact that the husband is the head as Christ is the head. Now, if you've ever read the Bible, you will know that Jesus never exerts aggressive authority over anyone. For him, leadership is about washing people's feet. It's about serving people, showing care, compassion and understanding. Think about the woman at the well. She was a prostitute, but Jesus treated her with compassion and respect. If you look carefully, I think you'll see that to submit to that kind of leadership is simply to let your feet be washed and to allow your husband to treat you with care, love and respect. Okay, definitely, I guess, a more affable interpretation in this case. But, you know, but what can we see? This person has made direct reference to the other two responses, or in this case, I should say other responses, okay? Um, not necessarily just these two, but he's making reference, or he or she is making reference to other texts, okay? This idea isn't in the original text itself, that's intertextuality, 
Okay, um, it refers to other Bible verses. Okay, so other parts of the Bible, if you've ever read the Bible, so we're making assumptions here that the reader has read the Bible. It's about washing people's feet. Now, in this case, if you're familiar with the, the story, um, you know, you might know that at the Last Supper, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. So that's a direct reference to that. That's intertextuality. Think about the woman at the well. Again, making the assumption that we know this story or we have familiar, uh, familiarity with it. That's a great example of intertextuality. He's also shared his own interpretation of Jesus' approach to leadership. You know, I think you'll see that to submit to this kind of leadership is simply to let your feet be washed. Okay, so what this person has essentially done is they have taken information from the original text in submitting to uh, your husband or submitting to the man in this case um, and taken examples from other parts of the Bible and then combined them to make their own personal interpretation. Okay, so very much their interpretation is the result of direct intertextuality okay, throughout, the, throughout the Bible. It's so really interesting to look at. Okay, um, so the big question, when you look at this, okay, you've just been through this process and you might choose to go back and look at some of these if you've been falling asleep, um, but which interpretation do you agree with? All of them, none of them, some of them, bits of each. You know, what is your impression of this verse? And has your impression of this verse changed since you've read these different interpretations? You know, I would hope that it probably has. If nothing else, it's got you thinking about it from different perspectives. And that's what this is all about. You know, the fact of the matter is um, that this type of interpretation is about building your understanding of the original text. Okay, at the end of the day, every interpretation is right. You can't say that they are wrong. It's purely how they interpret the text. Each carries effective points that we should consider. We shouldn't disregard any interpretation. Recognising this, we would say that having read all interpretations, this has ultimately taught us more about the verse than if we had only read one or if we'd only used our own interpretation. Okay? Your task is essentially to perform this process with the provided text. Okay, so I'm giving you something to read about Of Mice and Men, and I'm asking you to reflect on how it has changed your impression of what the text is about. Okay, and I, I feel fairly confident based on the text that I've picked that it will change your impression on what the text is about. It will get you thinking from a very different point of view. The question is, do you agree with it or not? Are there parts of it you agree with and parts that you don't? Do you think it's rubbish? Do you think it's a waste of time? Do you think the person is crazy? And at the end of the day, how has it changed your own impression of what this book is about? That's what you need to ask yourself. So what might your response look like? You know, this is something I want you to come back to and refer to as you're actually writing your piece, because here I'm giving you a bit of an example of what I expect you to write in regards to this task, okay? This is what I'm marking you on. Now, you'll write a little bit more than this. So I've tried to sum it up, I guess, without too much detail. You know, you could use examples. Uh, you can talk about positives and negatives, things you agree and don't agree with. Uh, but here's just an example of how I've taken information from those three different interpretations and I've put them all together to, um, you know, essentially show how it's changed my perspective of the text. All right, here we go. Having read the three interpretations on Ephesians, I've come to recognise that to submit to something is generally seen in a negative context, particularly from a feminist perspective. This is justified by a history of inequity and mistreatment due to a heavily male-dominated society. This male-dominated structure, however, is not completely one-sided as the pressure to lead and be in control also has a negative impact on men who can see this submission as an obligation on their part to be financially dependable and generally accountable for the well-being of their families. While these perspectives reflect a very real need for acceptance and change in our society, the third interpretation draws context to the verse, reminding us that the main focus is on the term Christ. And from this, I agree that the real call to action is for males to be like Christ, which by the interpretation of the writer implies being humble, compassionate and loving. OK, 
Okay, so what have I done in this case? I've recognized the three different perspectives and I, I've really, I've outlined the context of how I agree with them. You know, um, submit is seen in a negative context. And I, I don't think that that's incorrect. I think that when this first person said that, they were completely correct. I agree with that, particularly from a fairness perspective in this verse, this idea that females should submit to their husbands and that the husband is the lord of the family or lord of the house. You know, and I do think it's justified by what they hinted at, which was a history of inequity and mistreatment due to a heavily male dominated society. In this way, I'm summarising what I feel they've brought in through intertextual content. But I've also acknowledged what I agree with in that second one, you know, this the male dominated structure isn't all good news for men. Okay, it actually puts pressure on men to be in control. Um, they can see this submission as obligation, this idea that, oh, I have to do this because, you know, my wife or females in our society are submitting to me and expecting me to do this. Okay, you know, they're, they're expecting me to be financially dependable and accountable for their well being. You know, now, whether you agree with that or not, in this case, I've recognised that I can see how that could be an issue, okay? As well as that, I've taken out the fact that I agree um, with this interpretation. The writer implies that this isn't asking women to be slaves. You know, I don't see it as, as asking women to be slaves. I think the language is obviously, um, you know, very old and can be interpreted in some really negative ways. But I liked the fact that the writer implies that it's really about husbands being humble, compassionate and loving. You know, so that's a really interesting thing that I now walk away from this verse with this understanding, all of this stuff in my head. Okay, and I want you to think about that because you're going to do the same thing for your assignment and I want to hear about it. So some reflections. I focused on the facts of each interpretation that I agree with. Okay, you could do this as, you know, as, as a paragraph, but you could do a similar paragraph to express disagreement. I showed an understanding of the intertextual references implied through the texts. Okay, I identified them in my analysis, I acknowledged them, um, and I showed how I thought they were relevant. I made it clear which interpretation I felt best coincided with my own personal reflection of the text. Okay, these are the three things you're going to do. If I go back now to the three questions that you have to answer for this assignment, you're going to read uh, this interpretation of, of mice and men, you're going to look at your own essay and I want you to tell me about what do you agree with in this contrasting interpretation that you read? What don't you agree with in the interpretation? And what do you think was missing from the interpretations you've read? What does this interpretation, this new one, teach you about your essay that you might have overlooked? But what in your essay do you think might benefit this person's interpretation? If you can answer that question for me, um, then that's exactly what I'm expecting you to do. So look, hopefully you know, this has been a lengthy video, but there's a lot to take in here. I wanted to really talk it through in detail. Um, from here, you should be able to access the required materials, including the other article, um, to really make it start and get thinking. Come back to this, look at the examples, look at the contrasts, and look at the discussion as a way of really building a stronger understanding of intertextuality, because it's such an important word uh, and skill in terms of stage one and stage two.